And we are back. The trilogy continues. It's a lovely, lovely open source web development on Windows with ASP.NET. Uh, I am a Scott. Here is another Scott. I hope that most of you were here before. It was amazing. If you were not here for the last talk, I mean, like Prince came out and he did like a little impromptu set from some unreleased music and stuff. It was so amazing. He's just such a cool guy in person. Uh, sorry you missed that. Uh, also, the recording was lost, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, yeah, feel good about that. So we have set up here with just an extreme amount of preparation. Uh, five six. machines, six I, machines. I have one double stack. Oh, yeah, double stack. Excuse me, six machines. Uh, so it's very likely that none of this will work. So lower your expectations <laughs> right now, OK? So let's, let's get right into uh, the, first, the first demo here. Let me switch it. Go ahead and switch over to six for me. Okay. I'm going to look at this machine here. And uh, is that up on the, OK, here we go. So we're going to go in here, and I'm going to. Don't do that. So there's. Where's? Hank, you didn't. God dang it. Where's you, did not put, you didn't put Visual Studio on this machine. Uh, you have Synaptic's pointing driver. Good, good, good looking out. Um, Steve, USB key, quickly. No, I'm going to just, just install Visual Studio. I think there's probably so enough time we're, we're to gonna get. We're going to pause the. Uh, we're going to just talk take a break here. And a half uh, we're going to stop. Visual Studio. I'm going to download uh, this uh, two gig ISO file, and uh, we're just going to run over here because I don't have. I didn't even set up this machine, and uh, I'm very very nervous that maybe I won't be able to, to do this in time. This is a, a special preview that I've got a Visual Studio uh, 15, the next version of, of Windows. It's really, really great that we have Visual Studio 2015 and <laughs> Visual Studio 15, which, of course, 15 is larger than, uh, than 2015. So that's, you know, that's why. This is the anniversary edition. Is this anniversary edition? Uh, yeah. Why did they name uh, it Windows 10? Uh, because 7, 8, 9. That's what my eight-year-old told me, and it was not funny. Uh, I said, you're not funny, uh, you little, little eight-year-old. What is wrong with you? Um, so we're installing uh, this Visual Studio, and I've got a USB key here. Uh, you can you know, do it from a USB key, or you can pull it down from the, uh, the web here. We've been going for about a minute, 20 seconds here. Just finished? A setup completed. Uh, launch. Just, just, just hit start. I think this part takes longer than the installer. I, I so. think it might actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, no. Hey! There you go. That was about a minute 40 uh, from no Visual Studio to a Visual Studio. Off of a memory stick. We installed off, Visual Studio off a of memory stick of memory in a minute stick. and a half. I'm going to keep that for myself. And uh, this is about not just acquisition of uh, acquiring .NET or acquiring Visual Studio. It's about getting people into uh, Visual Studio, getting them into .NET, getting them into ASP.NET that maybe hadn't gotten into that before. There have been a number of times where I know I have run a hackathon. Maybe I've gone to a school and taught people how to do things in C Sharp. And it was like, hey, kids, you excited about computer science? Let's get this two gig ISO and then reboot our computer six times. And <laughs> Imagine that I'm going to be able to go in there with a flood of USB keys. I'm like, you get a Visual Studio, and you get a Visual Studio. And a minute and a half later, they're going to have VS. And then we're going to have web applications running. But let's say we don't even want to use VS. We'll go out to the command line. We'll type .NET new, .NET restore, .NET run, and we've got hello world running. And we've done the whole thing in just, in just minutes. That is the goal. That is coming. Uh, I think we've got our heads uh, screwed on straight this time. And I'm pretty stoked about it. So let's talk a little bit about some of the context. Where did our remote thingy go? The clicker, the Java clicker. Uh, let's talk about ASP.NET and some of the context, and then we'll do some uh, demos. Is that OK with you? Sounds great. OK, so a little bit of context here. You've got ASP.NET 4.6 in that upper left corner there. That's Web Forms and MVC. That's the ASP.NET 4.6 that we just released. It is mature. It runs on .NET Framework 4.6. And of course, we've got innovation happening at the compiler level with things like Roslyn. So even web forms developers can go and do things like asynchronous model binding and C Sharp 6 and 7 features. And you know, there's innovation happening that everybody gets, no matter what. Now, there is ASP.NET Core 1.0, right? That's the essence of ASP.NET. That is a unified framework. You can get a lot more detail if you go and check out Dan Roth's deep dive 
tomorrow, which is going to be fantastic. And that unification is the unification of MVC and Web API. So there is just one controller class. You derive from controller, and a MVC controller is a Web API controller. OK, here's where things get interesting. See, I can use the clicker. You have to point it. It's body English. It's like bowling. So .NET Core 1.0 runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and it has .NET Core libraries. But notice that ASP.NET Core spans those two frameworks. This is really important. A lot of people think that the, the, the road has forked uh, in a scarier way than it really has. You can run ASP.NET Core 1.0, this new framework, on .NET 4.6 and the same way as before. Windows is still our friend, and we want to make sure that ASP.NET is absolutely best on Windows. Yes. You can also, if you choose, run it on .NET Core 1.0. So that is a really great way to express that, I think. These things are released. They were released. So remember that 4.6 is happening. We just saw a release of 4.62. The full framework marches on with lots of cool new stuff. And as we saw in Scott's .NET Core session and .NET session, all up that we're going to see innovation at, uh, at those levels. Now, these things are open source. That means fully and completely open source. And we talked about what a great thing that is. And we've got contributions coming in from all over. And uh, it's crazy. Cats and dogs living together, and mass hysteria. And we've got Red Hat on stage. And we've got Bash in Windows. And at the end of the whole thing, Sacha is going to come out and go, gotcha. <laughs> made you all come to California and for the greatest April Fool's joke ever. <laughs> 10 years in the making, we made a foundation, we bought Xamarin, it's just, uh, <laughs> Microsoft got me. Ooh, you're so good, so good, Microsoft. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this slide, actually that go back to this. That slide is wrong. No, 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 go back to this slide. This slide is great. ASP.NET 5. We should so, talk about let's that. Let's talk about that for a second. So ASP.NET 5 was the original name because 5 is bigger than 4.6. <laughs> but that also implies that it has more functionality in a way that we did not express. It has different functionality, but it has been pared down to its core. It is totally modular, but it doesn't have some of the weight and the things that you have on the full framework. Well, also it's not it doesn't have the same capability sets as ASP.NET no. 4x does today. So for example, things like SignalR, Web pages, they're coming. So if you're a SignalR web pages <laughs> customer, those things are coming in ASP.NET Core. Yep. Uh, but they're going to come a little bit after RTM. We're just trying to get the thing out the door. Um, and so we renamed from ASP.NET 5 to ASP.NET Core 1, trying to imply that this is not the next thing that has more stuff than the previous thing. Right. It's actually a new thing. It's slightly different. Um, and it doesn't have all the stuff yet. But hopefully in a 1.1 one, one or a 1.2, we'll, we'll start getting yep. some of that parity back. And then one day when it's called ASP.NET Core 4.6? It'll be done. It'll be done, and then we'll, uh, we'll quit. <laughs> now, here is an interesting thing. Oh, and that's really cool. I want to point out that I did a lot of the animations myself. Uh, and the note there from the person that did the animations, pay no attention to that. <laughs> animation A from client. I did this animation. Sorry, I didn't scrub that. I did a bad job. I apologize. I realize I'm in California. If there's any vegetarians uh, here, that I'm going to use a meat-based analogy. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that there's just you're aware of that. Now, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big meat person, but uh, how do you like your ASP.NET? Okay, do you like well done? If you like it well done, you get Visual Studio. You know that it's baked. I don't know that people bake meat, uh, but uh, then you go to NuGet and you can be well. Uh, assured that it is good stuff, and you're probably not going to get uh, Salmonella or E. coli from Visual Studio. But if you like Medium well, you find it to be a little bit more tasty, gives you a little bit more to think about, uh, you like to chew on it a little bit, you can check out our CTPs, our community technology previews, and our betas and things like that. You can go Medium if you like. Look at our continuous integration drops. You s switch from NuGet to MyGet which is our own kind of private NuGet. And if you want your own NuGet in the cloud, you can go and get that at, uh, at MyGet, or it may be at another location soon. Medium rare, medium rare, this is where my wife will not eat this because she's afraid that it's bleeding still. Uh, you've got build from source. Rare, you're talking about feature branches. That's like, you, know, you find your favorite dev, and you, you, know, you go and fork his or her code, and then you start building it because you're just a fan. Uh, that's pretty rare, and you're probably gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
It turns out I was in Australia and there's a thing before rare. It's called blue. <laughs> That's when they just smack the cow in the butt and they send it out. And, uh, and I guess you write it home. Uh, <laughs> and this is where you're doing third party forks where you, know, you take scott.net uh, that's you know, his own private build of .NET, and you go and build that from source. The point here is choice, is choice, is choice. You don't like any of this? You think this is a stupid analogy? That's fine. Then just get something that's well done. You're going to be fine. Nothing changes. But if you want to do other things, we've already seen, as Scott demoed, that you can do this in a way that doesn't hurt your machine. We saw that .NET is not going to hurt your machine. And now we're seeing that Visual Studio itself is going to allow you to potentially run things side by side. If I had in fact, Visual Studio 2015 on that machine, that little install that I did there wouldn't have hurt it. Uh, we should have shown the uninstall. The uninstall is about as the fast as the uninstall. The uninstall is similarly fast. And it's you could like also uh, just you know, delete the folder, probably. Yeah. Cool. So uh, the other thing is that if you don't want to do Visual Studio, maybe you're interested in doing something else, you can go and check out OmniSharp, right, a community-based uh, project, an open source project that lets you run .NET and ASP.NET on Atom, on Brackets, on Emacs, if you want to use Emacs. Uh, you, know, you can get it to exit. And uh, if you want to use <laughs> Visual Studio Code or Sublime, this is totally legit. And what OmniSharp does is it externalizes IntelliSense. Remember how he said that the, uh, the, the remember how he said, uh, if I may, you said the Roslyn analyzer is running another thread. And I wanted to point out, well, it's really, it's actually another process and it's multi-threaded within there because we've externalized this thing. The compiler is a service so that now I can be in Emacs and typing and I hit dot and I communicate with that out-of-process service, and I get introspection on my code, and I get back IntelliSense, which is amazing because the naysayers say IntelliSense rots your brain, and now we're bringing that power to Emacs. <laughs> this is amazing, powerful stuff. And then whatever else makes you happy, right? People keep saying, when is Microsoft going to do this web framework that already exists? Or when are you going to prescribe me a way to do this web technology that already is happening? And we really believe that the web is doing these things, so maybe we should just get on board. So we're putting that support into the system. We're going to show you all sorts of cool stuff and some demos here. So let's switch over to your machine there, sir, and talk about some of the new focuses, because there's some other things that you're focused on uh, in ASP.NET Core. I'm on, you're on this screen now. I know. So let's, let's start with this. And uh, these are Hit, web uh, framework benchmarks. Yeah, control plus. I was earlier, actually. Or do that. There we go. These so, are, this is the uh, Tech Empower this benchmark. Is, this is Tech Empower. Um, you so, familiar with this benchmarking system? It's a very, it's a very popular web benchmarking thing that is, uh, that's one of those things where uh, you see some amazing numbers of things you've never heard of, and then you scroll to the bottom, and ASP.NET's there, and you go, oh, mm -hmm, kind of sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, Scruffy? Scruffy is better than ASP.NET? That's unacceptable. It, Grizzly? Grizzly is totally kicking. But what's interesting uh, here, Scott, is, 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 is like, you know, I, isn't Node.js the fastest web framework? Uh, is Node.js the fastest web framework? I don't know. Uh, Undertow um, is pretty sweet. Let's, where is, where is? Where is Node? Dart? Node. Oh, there we go. Down there at 287,000 requests a second. Now, you know, don't disrespect Node. I like my Node. I like it, too. Yeah. But the point is that there are fast frameworks out. Now, some of these frameworks are experiments. Some of these frameworks are academic. Some of these are examples where you're comparing uh, F, you know, Formula One cars and minivans and uh, putting them next to each other and racing and then saying, hey, minivans, man, they suck. So let's talk about where ASP.NET lands in this space. So first off, are we a minivan? I hope not. <laughs> not anymore. Um, we are a Formula One car now. That's a bold statement, sir. So, Mike, should Microsoft be making bold statements like that? Yes. All right. OK. So uh, this is an empty ASP.NET Core application. And we want to show that there's not a lot in here. This looks actually like a Node application. Basically, there's an entry method configure here. Right. And I run uh, a, a chunk of code here that writes hello world after the screen. Right. And so if you look at that Tech Empower benchmark, and we start running that benchmark on ASP.NET Core, the reason we get some awesome performance, and I'll, I'll actually show that performance before I run the demo here, is We'll go back here and look and see what our performance looks like. Um, this is not going to scale very well, because uh, it's Power BI. Um, so this is the Power BI dashboard? Yes. And then you just went in here, and this is, this is real numbers, right? So this is a Power BI expression of those numbers. Yes. So then this allows, allows us to Running on similar hardware as the Tech around. Empower benchmark is, 
and you'll see that ASP.NET's running at... Uh, Where's ASP.NET? Oh, we're the big one. 3.6 million requests a second there. 3.4? Did yeah. you, you just made this in Excel. <laughs> this is real. Real. We run that I same... Thought, I thought we were at one point something million. We are. This is on better hardware than we run in, in our labs. This is our... We have a perf lab, and we have the ASP.NET team lab. The ASP.NET team lab runs on some slower hardware. This is on some crazy hardware that matches what the tech and power So wait, do we have a performance team? We have a perf team, yes. 3.4 million requests per second. Per second. But that's just hello. Well, yeah, clap for that. That's just, that's just hello world, though, right? That's not, you know, I've only put a several That is hello world, hello but, but we also have take, taken things like big MVC applications. We have a port of Orchard, which is a CMS written right. on top of MVC, uh, that our team and the community has built together right. over the last couple of years. Their port to .NET Core sees a 10 times performance improvement for an MVC application. 10x. So your MVC application, when you move the .NET Core, should be 10 times faster than it was before, minus if you're talking to databases and web APIs and stuff like that. And, and, and we won't get into the actual details of that right now. Dan will talk a little bit about that. But there's historical context and things that were being happening in 2001 that don't happen now that makes this possible. There's not just improvements in hardware, but in how we deal with memory, how we think about garbage collection, how we think about data structures. Memory is, is a big thing of this. And, and, and another part of this is, Scott had a slide earlier that said we're modular. In this case, I'm showing an ASP.NET application that has nothing but this code in it. Right, where are all the HTTP modules and HTTP handlers There's, and web forms and all that stuff? None of that stuff is in here. In fact, but, if, I, if I do things like throw an exception. So is even, uh, yeah, is, is MVC in here anywhere? There's no MVC. Okay. So you're going to throw a exception. If he had the FX cop, it would tell him don't throw base class exception. Uh, I, in, I a typical, in a typical MVC, MVC application, you would see a big yellow screen yeah, of yellow death. Yellow screen of death right now. And nothing. So you didn't include the error. Uh, we should probably make that a feature. You didn't include the error page. There is no error page. You, so the error page is optional. This is modular ASP.NET. There is, there is nothing here. Because error pages add overhead. And you don't really want an error page. No, I'm just kidding. The point is, if it's modular, you get to pick what you want. If you're trying to do a benchmark, you remove everything, right? This is why uh, you take the helmet off when you ride the, the motorcycle. Um, but if he wants to bring that in, he brings that in. If he wants to bring in static files, he brings in static files. If he wants to bring in MVC, he brings in MVC. If he doesn't like MVC, and he brings in something out else, and he uses uh, Nancy or a third-party project because we're all on a level playing field, and we just add ourselves to the pipeline. So now I've added app.use. Oh, and you added a developer exception Developer page. exception page, because that's really where the error page should be for the most part. Which is different than the production of yes. the error page. Is it a, is it a smiley face? It's, I like it. It's the light blue screen of death. <laughs> but it gives me developer-specific stuff. It tells me the headers that I want and all of the different background information. So and, we'll, but, but can I have my own, though? You can have your own. I mean, totally that's, custom. It's middleware, so you can actually add anything you want to this middleware. If you want to add, if you want to replace any of our components, because we're not shoving them all in by default, right. As part of a monolithic framework, now it's all modular. You can just take any of our pieces, right. Which are also open source. You can just take mine, uh, change it, change the colors, whatever, compile it up, and stick it in instead of ours. Mm -hmm. And think about that in the context of putting this in your company. You can have your company official error pages. It's all about modularity. And, and then everything's open source, so if you want to take one of our things, fork it, clone it, do something else different with it, you can do that. What are you doing now, sir? So in my www root folder, I have this index.html. Right. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, you, www, notice that www root is now moved down one. You don't just drop HTML files in your root now. There's a difference between the server-side build and the client-side build, right? Typically, with ASP.NET, you start cluttering your root of your project with, fo with folders and things like that. So he just put index.html in there, and he hit uh, slash index.html, and I assume that that's going to pop up. It did not. It said, hello, world, because there's nothing there that says serve static pages. It is really a, a kind of a cafeteria plan. And you can go in there and pick what makes you happen. So he's going to go and pick static files. He's going to grab that and bring it in. And then you can have collections of these things, right? You can go and say, well, you know, I want to trick this car out the way that I want it tricked out. And then that's our new standard. And that project template will be the one we'll use. So then it's file new, your company's preferred way of doing things. All right index.html, 
boom. So there's your. So the point is, this is the way the, the way these benchmarks happen is we were able to actually modularize ASP.NET down to a point where if you have parts of your code that need to be mm -hmm. super high performance, you can actually run none of the framework stacks on those parts of the URLs. Right. And other parts of the URLs, you might want to actually have full MVC and Web API and Signal R and all that kind of stuff. And so you can dial that stuff back. Okay. Let's quickly go through these. The Very briefly, just go ahead and zoom in on the Solution Explorer there. We'll do a little lap let me, around. Let me go to a bigger project to, sh to show you that. Make so. me a bigger project. Uh, and I want to point out that what I'm going to show you in this talk, what this talk is, isn't necessarily you know, the internals and the details of ASP.NET, but rather how does ASP.NET Core fit into an ecosystem? How does it fit into the world? Where is our place now as .NET and ASP.NET developers? And then for even more deep dive and internals, you can go and check out, of course, the Code Labs or Dan Ross. And Dan Ross going to have two different go sessions. He's going to have a whole session on deploying, and he's going to have a session on uh, MVC and the internals. So it used to be CS Proj. Oops. Is now project.json. Okay. And the reason we broke CS Proj out to project.json mm -hmm. was because we want to be able to support cross platform. And so we looked at trying to have CS Proj files on a Mac and trying to type those by hand, and they're kind of hard to type. CS Proj is an XML based kind of XML thing. XML based thing. And JSON is the new hotness. So we just basically did a search and replace. It's the new XML. Uh, we changed all of the angle brackets to curly braces, and it's good. But it's a but it's a plain text it's a plain text file that yeah. contains all the requirements for the app to actually run. But the thing that's significant is how many times have you had a situation you've been working as a team, and someone added a file or removed a file from the CS proj, and then it's merge hell as you go and try to figure out those things. So we went to a rather than including the things that you want, we inverted that. So everything that is in the folder is in the project, and then the things that you don't want you exclude. So that inverted it, and that works with modern frameworks and modern uh, source control. We're adding support also for things like Bower and NPM. So instead of having scripts being brought in via NuGet, which somebody has to go, ramp, you know, go wrap a script in NuGet and right. put it into the NuGet, which is .NET, which feels weird for JavaScript, right. um, we've built support in for both Bower and NPM individual studios. So the way to get jQueries and Angulars right. and Reacts is via this tooling. A lot of times people will call me and say, hey, why isn't Angular in NuGet? It's because NuGet is for server-side .NET code. And the web, the people on the web, the set of all people who are not ASP.NET developers, go and get those things at other package managers, Bower being an example, then we want to play along. And if another package manager rises to the top, then we will support that. NuGet is for .NET code, and NPM is for you know, tools and some libraries. And in this case, we're using Bower to get uh, JavaScript. And then I don't have to worry about making a random NuGet for Angular. Right. Because literally, it was me and John Papa, and we were the ones that made the Angular thing. And that's totally not OK. Uh, we'll do one final thing here and show. Uh, yeah, this is cool. Gulp files. Particularly the small, if you're out of, from out of America, this is a small size soda pop on the right hand side there, uh, using a tool called Gulp. Gulp is kind of like a build system, except it's for client side build. Remember, I said there's the server side build of your .NET code, there's the client side build of the minification and the concatenation of all of your JavaScript. That build, can, that build can be a little bit confusing, but if you zoom in there on bindings for me, what you can do here with this uh, task runner explorer is it understands that gulp file, and I can go and say, well, I want clean, see? I That's want clean to run before here's, my MS build task. Here's the things in the gulp file. We've got clean, clean JS, there's right. a bunch of tasks. Minify. And all these tasks now show up down here. And then I can click on one of these and decide to run it manually right now yeah. or bind it to some build event inside right. of Visual Studio. So make sure you do this to the CSS before you build the application. So it's a nice balance. And I want to point out that you've got uh, visual tooling for stuff, and you've got great JavaScript editors for doing that as well. So if you're a text person, that's cool. But the visual in Visual Studio is still there. And we're going to see that throughout this entire presentation. We'll show one more thing, and we'll move over to your crazy stuff. We're about two minutes behind. Yes, we are. I run a tight ship. So this is a uh, existing MVC application. And look at this beautiful HTML. Um, somehow we, we created this awesome razor syntax and thought we were improving HTML and, and all this. And if I look at this HTML file, it does not look like HTML. It looks like a bunch of C sharp. Um, and so one of, the, one of the biggest features we have in ASP.NET Core is a feature called Hack Helpers. And if I go look at this exact same page, in ASP.NET Core, it now looks like HTML. And this is super important because as we started trying to build Angular and React apps with ASP.NET, right. um, Mads Christensen on our team builds these awesome HTML and CSS editors. We lost all those features because we were in C Sharp all the time. And so we found a way to intermix um, ASP.NET uh, Razor 
and regular HTML by using attributes on HTML. So if you see an ASP dash right. attribute, it tells us we need to run some ASP.NET stuff here. But it also means that I can come over here and I actually get IntelliSense for Bootstrap or whatever CSS that I have in my application. Now, this is not, these are not web form controls. These are smart tags that make code that looks like that, which it provides a little bit of context switching, look more like this. And it's over more here. more HTML and less uh, code to think about. Right, this, the uh, C-sharp editor has, knows nothing of this, and so it can't give me any IntelliSense. So that's a quick run through of the major things. Dan Ross gonna do a deep dive, as Scott was saying. Yep. And now we're gonna show some crazy voodoo. Yeah, let's show some crazy voodoo, because uh, why not, right? I don't even know. Which screen do you want to go Am to? I allowed to show this? Show me on, put me on 5B. And I'll just do a random switch. Freak out everyone in the back there. We're going to hot swap. There you go. All right. So this is a, this machine right here. And I wanted to show a little bit about the bash stuff that was going on. We talked about Bash on Windows, this partnership with Ubuntu, some of the cool stuff that's going on. A couple things I want to cover first. This is the command prompt that we, we know and love. And this command prompt here, I'm going to go ahead and click Control-C, Control-V. It's nice. doesn't work if you don't put CD in front of it. And then I'm going to go and say ASP.NET Core at build. And then I'm going to go down into command line. And I'm going to say, Alt enter, right? A little full screen action. <coughs> and then I'm going to go and make a new desk, you know, new, new terminal, a new virtual desktop there. And maybe I'll pick this up and I will drag that down over into this desktop here and I will make that full screen. And then I will switch back and forth between that. And then using a new feature coming soon on precision touchpads, four finger swipe to switch virtual desktops. They told me it was okay to say that. You like that? In order to support all the different developer tools that are out there, to support Gawker, to support Emacs, to support the important things that we want to see as developers, uh, we needed to add new support for things like ANSI and VT100 and control codes and cool stuff. So I went and I got some BBS ANSI art from 1997. Hang on, don't clap yet because it doesn't look right. Why does it not look right? Well, because terminals were 80 characters wide. So I got to get it exactly right. That's a good one. There's a little bit of a, uh, it's just a daily build. So we got a couple of issues that aren't perfect. Let me try another one here. I got these at 16colors.net. This is uh, for my bulletin board. Come and check me out. Get that almost right. You get the idea. Those that support, and I'm, I need to figure out how to get that snake to show up. But you get the idea. Uh, that is con host, the console host. All of those improvements you get in command, in PowerShell, and in Bash. So you're going to see more stuff. There's a team of people improving the Windows console now. One of the things that they did that they told me it was also okay to say was that they're making it fast because they're taking out some of the old GDI code. So they said that it's something like two or 3,000 frames a second now. And it's using... <laughs> not, not to mention word wrap works very nicely as well. All right? So let's talk about why you would care. Let's go out to... It's awesome. I want to point out here that I'm in Bash, and I've got the Ubuntu Mono fonts. There's a whole new class of fonts that we can bring in now. If you go under fonts in uh, the console here, you've got piles of cool new fonts that we can use to bring in other fonts. So anything that's true type and mono space can be in there. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to get uh, ASP.NET talking to Redis. This is a common scenario, right? They use Redis, like, for example, Stack Overflow. So I went out on the interwebs, and I found this great article about how to install Redis. And then I saw like, you know, the dollar sign or the hashtag, and I go, oh, it's not for me. <laughs> Actually, when we, when we launched the Redis cache in Azure, I got a lot of people asking me, how do I test this stuff locally? Mm -hmm. And we said, just go build one in the cloud. Um, 
because of what Scott just showed you. It's kind of hard to run it on Windows. Right. Now, you could go and find a fork of Redis that's you know, the one, a Windows one. But uh, in this case here, you might want to go and do this. So you have real apt-get, right? Apt-get is your or apt-install is the way that you get packages on, uh, on Ubuntu. But in this case, there isn't a Redis in the Ubuntu app. So I needed to go and add a couple of lines of code here. And what I did is I just went in and added these lines into this .deb .list file. And then right now, if I say, say uh, Redis, there is no Redis. If I say Redis server, there is no Redis server. So I'm going to go and say uh, apt get install Redis server. And it's going to say, is that OK? Don't clap yet. It didn't work. I don't want your pity clap. We don't know if it's going to work. Don't tease me, right? Who knows? This whole thing could go south, and then you've got a waste of a clap. Right? Just like that. So now look what you've done. Feel bad about yourselves at this point. So there's 64-bit Redis running in standalone mode that I did an apt get on, and it's running on Windows. Don't clap yet. So here I'm going to go in, and I'm going to go and grab the Redis cache stuff for ASP.NET, and I'm going to just run this little app. I'm talking to localhost. Okay? So we're in Visual Studio. We're doing some, uh, some ASP.NET. I'm going to put ASP.NET over here. I'm going to put Redis over there. And I'm going to go and say something like, you know, set value. That might, this is going to return some JSON. I'm going to try to do it like this. And I'm going to say set value, foo bar. And we'll say set uh, Scott slash Hunter. OK? So successfully set the value for Scott in the cache. I'm going to hit Shift. I'm going to bring up a new bash. So I've got two bashes running now. I'm going to go and say Redis CLI. And then I think I say, is it hget Scott? No, hget all? You see, I do a lot of Redis. It's pretty advanced stuff. So there's Scott Hunter in the Redis cache. So that's cool. So I'm doing that locally. And it took me, in, in reality, it took me about 10 minutes to get Redis running on this machine. So I thought that was kind of cool. Now I recognize that you're holding your applause until the very end, and that's fine. And everyone's, everyone's like, he started ordering us around, and I don't really know. Uh, it's really not really appropriate to be asking for applause, Scott. So stop doing that. Um, so now I'm going to go and change this. I'm going to grab this super secret code that none of you can see, and I'm going to drop that in here. And this is my Redis in Azure. Okay? So I'm just going to switch and run the exact same app now. And then I can go over into Azure. And uh, we'll sign into my Azure account in the portal. And while I'm doing that, we'll uh, hit this again a couple of times. And Scott Hunter and friends runs this great Azure Redis in the cloud service. Here's the uh, Hansel cache. And I can see hits and misses right there. So now I've got ASP.NET on Windows, running on Windows, running on .NET Core from Visual Studio, talking to a local Redis cache. And then when, I'm time, when it's time to grow up to the cloud and run on Azure in the cloud, I'm able to do that. And I thought that is pretty cool, because that's the kind of stuff where a barrier was there on the internet, and that barrier is now gone. So another cool idea that I thought, because you, know, you just don't think about why you might want to do this until you do it, I had my buddy go and take this Raspberry Pi here running Windows 10 IoT Core, not running Raspbian. And he got an ARM build. He went and took the code for .NET Core and built uh, an ARM version of .NET Core, and then ASP.NET on the thing. And then I'm going to go now, and I'm, gonna, I'm, on, I'm on my, uh, my desktop machine right here. And I need to get his, uh, his password, which is a really hard word. Um, where did I put that? It's, he's, uh, he's Polish, and I don't know how to type that in. 
So now I'm going to go enter PS session and I'm going to go and talk. So I'm going to remote from PowerShell. I'm going to go using WinRM and remote over into the Raspberry Pi. Okay, pressure's on. And we're going to go and do this and that. The Raspberry Pi is thinking extremely hard about that. And this doesn't mean that we're promising you Raspberry Pi support. Uh, it means that when, when Pavel decided that, hey, I'm going to see if it works on Raspberry Pi, he was able to do it because everything was available to him. He told me that this was one of the things he did on a Saturday afternoon. So there's no reason for us to keep it from running on a Raspberry Pi, is there? We wanted to run in Raspberry Pi. You so. wanted to run in Raspberry Pi? OK, so now, if you'll notice right here, I am on that Raspberry Pi. That's, you see the difference in the, in the shell there. So I'm going to go into C temp where all good development happens. And uh, I'm going to go into uh, hello ASP.NET 5 arm. This is, uh, here we go. And I'll go into app root. And then I will go and I will run, uh, is it dot web on this case, or just web? And I made a nice little 3D printed case for this machine. And then I've got my IP address is 10.5.something-something-something, 72.196. It's up now, so. OK, it's up. And it's thinking. Dot zero. Dot five. If only, my kingdom for a developer. If only there was a developer here five to help me. Five, you're I, know, to. I know, I know, I <laughs> know. I meant to do that. Now, of course, it says five. And I need to update it to Lots core one. <clears throat> so I realize that it doesn't actually have 64K. But uh, it's kind of cool to say you know, from 64K to 64 gigs or whatever. And uh, it, it gives you a sense of the power of what is potentially possible when we go and do this. Well, this just shows you our .NET strategy is to have .NET run everywhere. Yeah, why not? So actually, what a nice segue. You threw me right there. That's great. <laughs> he says uh, .NET everywhere. So let's talk about what some of these uh, experiences would be like when one wants to run stuff everywhere. Um, this machine here, am I on five? Can you put me on, am I on five still? This You're one? on five still. OK. I've got this lovely new thing here. Here we go. I'm going to go and say Hyper-V on this machine. And then I'm going to go and type in Docker. And this is the new Docker for Windows beta. And while that comes up, go ahead and put me on eight there. The Docker for Windows beta is happening right now. And you can sign up at beta.docker.com. In the past, I found Docker to be intimidating to set up. It's, it's possible, but it's a lot of uh, keys. And on Windows, it can be a little bit of a challenge. And in the past, it's used VirtualBox. Yeah, so it required you to install VirtualBox, a whole bunch of other I had to switch software. hypervisors back and forth. So what I did is I just downloaded this thing. I made sure Hyper-V was on my box. I ran Docker. It automatically automated Hyper-V, got the correct small little, what they call Moby, a container, I started it up, set up all the certificates and things I might need, and now I've got a little, little Docker Moby down there in the corner. I can come out to Command, or I can come out to PowerShell, and I can type Docker. Slide, switch out. I'm going to do that again. It's more impressive when you see it. <laughs> I've got a little Docker Moby right there. I always like to say we'll fix that in post, uh, but no one ever uh, does that. I can go and type Docker PS or Docker images and see what's going on there. So, so how do I talk to Docker, and why would, I, why would I want to do that? Well, I can get these really nice, reliable deployments where I'm always sure that the thing is going to work the way that I want. I now have a container to hand you and say, here is my Docker image, and here's my Docker file, and it's going to work reliably. Why would I want to use Docker? Why would you, I just told you that. I literally just said that. Eh, a little bit. You want to say why we would use Docker? Scale up fast. There's a half different, well, I haven't got to that part yet. OK. No, because there's reliable deployments, then there's resilient deployments, and then there's scalable deployments. You've got to work your way up here. And there's, also, it's having, a nice there's, there's also being able to build an app on your machine yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and have that same environment that your production environment is on your machine. That's a great point. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second here. Awesome. So actually, you know, darn you for, for messing up my, my demo. Let's just, uh, let's just do that. Let's switch over to here and talk about the difference between production and not production. Go ahead and hit, uh, hit 7 for me. So on this machine here, we've got a little uh, Docker action going on. 
And let me go and just run the regular way. I'm just going to go and run my application in IIS Express and see how things are going on here. I've got an app that's in production. Here's production. Here's my app in production. It's on prod. I go and run my application in localhost so I can compare prod and, produ and, and localhost. Here's my app in production. Then when someone says, hey, you know, I was clicking around on the about page in production and I got this error. I'm like, okay, well, that kind of sucks. Uh, let me go over here and run that. And then it's like, all right, let's see what's going on. Works on my machine. <laughs> right? So then, you know, you just close the ticket and uh, <laughs> probably wasn't anything. Uh, maybe you could hit refresh a couple of times, right? Just say, just hit refresh and uh, make sure the computer's on. So what's going on with that? Well, I've been running it. It just runs fine. There was no exceptions here. Well, I'm going to go and do this. I'm going to make sure that I've got Docker on my machine and make sure that my project knows about Docker. I can actually right-click now in Visual Studio, and I can say, add Docker support. Oh, yeah. I love that. It, See, when, when you get that genuine reaction, I don't care about any of you all, one person was like, oh, and then they caught themselves like, oh, it's an excited utterance. I was just like, I didn't even know where that came from, but that's exactly, I never knew I wanted that, and now that I want, want it, I must, I must be a part of this. So add Docker support inside of here, and then we've got Docker files, Docker Compose, and we've got this really cool PowerShell script that's going to integrate with all of our MS Build and stuff. So watch this. I want to see if that person freaks out again. Okay, so we're going to hit go and do it. Starting the containers. Goes and says stopping conflicting containers because it's got to do the different administrivia that is involved in going and doing something like uh, Docker on uh, this machine because I want to find out what is going on in, uh, in production. I may have hit that button twice. Is that, did I bump that button twice there, Steve? Let's try that. Oh, hang on. Ah, it's chaos. And Bing is like, hey, get the sports scores. <laughs> Try it again. I double clicked on the Docker thing, and I started two separate Docker sessions, I think, at the same time. So it says stopping conflicting containers and using port A. You see it's integrated inside there in the output, and it's going and figuring out the different layers that it has to do uh, within Docker. So you've got integration with these Docker tools. It's not that hard, and you're going to have that integration uh, in Visual Studio. Visual Studio will know that Docker is a thing. But what's significant here is I said, start a debug session using the production container. And I want to tunnel that debug experience into Docker. So we're going to do a live debugging session going from Windows on IIS, where the bug isn't a problem, over to Docker on Linux, which more represents that production So you're remote, de you're remote, remote debugging, debugging into a Linux container. Right. I'm remote debugging into a Linux container. And then when I go and I hit that, I actually get a appropriate exception, time zone not found. Well, it turns out that, gosh, operating systems are different. And um, the, apparently there's some things that go on when uh, operating systems are different. It might be path names or stuff. I might need to use things. Like, now, this is not exactly the perfect uh, fix. So to be clear, I do a little bit more of a runtime check. But here I'm going to say switch from computer name to host name. But notice the time zone issue there. Uh, I'm going and saying go Eastern Standard Time, but in fact, on Linux, they want to see America slash New York. So we're going to go over here and we'll uncomment that. And we will get rid of, we'll get rid of this. Yeah, hostname. Okay. Hostname equal up okay. I'm totally meant to do that. Why are you guys being so mean to me? Do I need to go this and then comment this? Okay. I love pair programming. <laughs> do I do that? Yeah, it looks better. How about I just comment out the whole page? <laughs> Is that going to work, Steve? <clears throat> Can you compile that in your mind real quick with Rosalind? Set a breakpoint. I can't do that. You got a null check at the end of the null. What? I'm not, you guys are trying to like, improve my code here. <laughs> what do you want me to do, man? Give me a line number. I see how I got line numbers. I can sit here, but I could also. Like that? Okay. I'm at the end of the line. You know what you want to do? <laughs> is that cool? Is it going to run? He says, just run it. Steve has lost patience with me, apparently. <laughs> I thought we had a good thing here, Steve. 
All right, so it's going and building that, and we're still in production, and I've set a breakpoint now, and we're going to get that full debug experience inside of, so you see the Docker commands running by there, it's going to go run .NET build, okay? Stopping the previous container, the conflicting container, and bring another container up, which is hot, okay? And we're going to be back over here in a second, starting the containers. And I'm going to move this off to the side, Oop. okay? Is it going yet? No, it's still thinking about it. Recreating. The, the, the tension is so thick you can cut it with a knife. Is it loading now? Yeah, it's, I can see that it's moving. Yeah. Thank you. This must be, must be what it feels like when I'm standing over you. It is. Is that how it works? I should probably stop doing that. You should. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here we can go and step through this code and see what's going on. And you look down here. We can see what's null and what's not null. You can see those runtime checks happen. You can see, look, and then we got the right time zone working because we're on Linux on this particular machine running inside of Docker. And then we get a F5 page that loads. So now I understand the issue there. I bumped into a number of interesting issues going between Windows and uh, Linux, like case sensitivity versus case you know, preservation and things like that, that have been extremely interesting. But so, this is still super cool. You just remote debugged a Linux no, container. They don't care. They don't appreciate it. Come on. That. Now, we, I, you know, I talked to Jeffrey Snover this afternoon. He was talking about how we're going to have that Docker API support for Windows containers, for Windows Hyper-V containers. They're going to be more isolated. So this was Docker on Linux using the new beta of Docker uh, for Windows. There's some great stuff coming. Again, these are daily builds and daily bits, but this is the direction that we're heading. And we, we just remote debugged a Linux VM running .NET Core on all in one machine. Right? And of course, as you said, we'll do containers on Windows, yeah. and they even have more secure containers on Windows. Yeah, yeah, well, Hyper-V so. containers, exactly. So let's see uh, what kind of damage we could potentially do with this kind of thing. So if I can run ASP.NET Core on Linux, I can run on Windows, I can run it on any cloud, I can use any kind of thing that I want to, let's see if we could actually run it on, on any cloud. So uh, I was, we were up all night, uh, Steve uh, was up and I was uh, sleeping, and uh, we went, like for example, to the Docker cloud. This is the Docker cloud, and we put the containers for one of these applications, these test applications, uh, up in the cloud. If you've got a laptop, you might want to get it ready because there's a live demo coming that you're going to participate in. And then we said, well, that's pretty cool, but then maybe we should go over to Amazon as well and deploy that same container because that would be cool. Uh, and then Steve was like, but it's not, it's not enough. We have to go deeper. Uh, we went and we did Marathon and Azure ACS, and we figured let's do Azure Container Service and deploy it there. And I said, well, that's cool, but uh, that's not enough. Uh, we should probably go to Visual Studio Online, and Visual Studio Online should probably automatically know how to go and build and push Docker images as part of a continuous integration server. Don't clap. I don't want your pity. And then Steve said, but that's not <coughs> enough, Scott. Why don't we go and load balance the whole thing behind a single URL so that when you hit it, you each get a different cloud? And I said, that's probably a good idea. Why don't we try that? And then uh, Steve was like, well, then why don't you uh, like tweet it and then tell everyone on the computer to, uh, to go and click on that so you can go to whereyouat.trafficmanager.net. And I just tweeted that. Okay? And where you at .trafficmanager.net is going to kind of do a geo load balancing, and we're going to have people from all over the place hit that. And then there's a button on that page, okay? And the button on the page, hit five, is going to tell you some interesting stuff. It's going to tell you where it is. So on this machine, I'm running. I just hit this. I'm running on AWS EC2, and I'm going to say get my location, and it's going to say hey, and it's going to get your lat lawn your latitude and longitude, but if you're watching at home on the stream, it's only going to do it to one decimal point precision. So I don't want to know where your house is. I just want to know what city you're in. Now, look at this here. This is machine number five. Go ahead and hit machine seven for me, sir. I'm glad that you're checking your email there. I'm, I'm um, actually and then, your URL. Uh, here, this one hit ASP.NET on Azure ACS, which is pretty cool. So now, I'm going to, no, don't clap. We're not done. It's so much better. Just let me go. Oh my god. It's crazy. Hit five again, sir. Um, so now I'm going to go 
and look at that. I got five retweets, and, and Richard says it worked for me. Not what we were looking for, but uh, that's cool. Now we got, we got two likes, so now uh, my self-worth has been validated. So now switch back over to seven. This may be, I may, not, I may actually be never able to, to, um, to do a better demo than this. <laughs> it's not done yet, but in a minute, it's going to be the best demo in the, seek, in the entire world. I'm going to hit slash super secret. And now we're seeing people from all over the world hitting the site, and I'm putting down the pin of which cloud that they're on, and it's happening right now in real time. And if I go and hit refresh, we'll see some more people, and they're going to keep bouncing around the world. And now the machine. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. <laughs> And then, and, then, and then Steve said, but that's not enough, Scott. <laughs> Last call doesn't happen yet. So we should probably go and tell you exactly which container IDs are happening and which containers took which thing and how all of that traffic's being managed. Because right now, we've gone, and gone, from, we've gone from a container situation to an orchestration of container situations. So we've got this geographic load balancer that then goes into the local load balancers that then is deciding which container it should use and how it should distribute that traffic. If Steve wanted to, he could go and add more containers or remove containers. And we could probably hit refresh and see uh, if we can uh, just tempt the, uh, the demo gods, because uh, you know, why keep hitting refresh until it actually crashes? And then I'm going to go over here and see how many. Um, they'll take. Oh, I've got 78 retweets. Oh my goodness! So it's getting okay, bigger and yeah. bigger and bigger. So let's go and see if we can find out. Look, someone's in Chile, and I'm going to zoom in, find out exactly where they are. What's that? Uh, cruise ship. It's a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the idea. That is either a cruise ship or it's zero zero, or someone is running a, a fiddler and, uh, trying to, <laughs> and trying to draw their name in the, in the middle of the Atlantic. So I respect those people. I, I got to give you credit for trying. We can see the Azure cloud, the Docker cloud, the Amazon cloud. And I do want to give a shout out that we tried really hard to get this on Kubernetes, but then they said the last call. And, uh, but it's totally possible to, to go and do that. So I want you to give uh, a big hand for Steve Lasker to help me pull Stand that up, demo please, together. Steve. Stand up, Stand up, Steve. And also, uh, Glenn. Also, uh, Maria from my team, Glenn from Scott's team, and Jeff Fritz all helped on that to make that silly little demo possible. And that is completely and 100% real. So I would encourage you to just beat on it until it falls over, because I think Steve's got to turn it off tonight. OK? So that is really exciting. That is not just reliable, but it is resilient, resilient deployments. And it's pretty exciting stuff. And go ahead and uh, switch back over there. Oh, wow. Look at that. How many, how many retweets do we got? Hang on. Go back. Go back. Go back. 5A. That's cool. It's down for me. Never mind. Well, it's OK. I feel bad now. We broke it. I don't think it is up. Let me hit refresh. No, it's, it's totally up. It's good. I feel like that was awesome. a success. Did you feel good about that? It's good. All right, very cool. Oh, I didn't, uh, didn't think that was going to work at all. <laughs> yeah, cool. So that was very frantic and very exciting. But let's talk about what we saw here. We started at the beginning to get a sense of where ASP.NET is going to fit into the world. I want to be able to go into a hackathon, go into a school. I want to be able to sit down. I want to be able to give someone a great open source code editor, like Visual Studio Code, that they can download and be running .NET or ASP.NET in minutes. I want them to be able to go and do cool stuff at the command line. But why don't you go ahead and bring me on six here, like this. So here we are sitting on this application. And I can go and type in .NET. It says .NET dash dash help tells me that I can go and make a new .NET program. I want somebody to go and type .NET new and get hello world. And then I want them to be able to type .NET new web or web empty and get a little web application. And then a slightly larger web application. And then one that's more like a Visual Studio template. And then I want them to be able to open it up in whatever editor makes them happy, or Visual Studio, which they will be able to install in minutes. Type code dot there. Type what? Code space dot. Code space dot. It's going to automatically pick up that folder. And now we're here. 
and you see down there in the corner, OmniSharp is running. Does you want me to do the ignore restore? That. No, just ignore ignore that. that. That doesn't make for a good demo when you say ignore that. And I start typing something, and I get IntelliSense inside of a great open source editor. This is actually written in TypeScript, using the Monaco uh, framework there. I can then go and take a USB key and get full Visual Studio soon, a modular Visual Studio. One of the things we didn't dig too much into was the idea that I could say, I want this Visual Studio to do F Sharp and web programming and Python. A lot of us forget about that kind of stuff. You can close that and actually run the app. That's actually ASP.NET ASP on uh, .NET CLI. So this is .NET CLI. Just so say you, can do, run. you can do a restore, a, a build. .NET build. Previously compiled. Yep. .NET run. OK. And there you go. That's self-hosted. And then let's run it on 5,000. And one of the demos that we like to do sometimes that's a lot of fun is to go and take something like that and say .NET publish, pack everything up. Remember we said that where do you get that .NET framework? You get it with the application. We could go and we could get the Mac version of this. And that USB key, I could go and put that project on that USB key and I could grab a Mac out of the room here and we could run it directly off of the USB key. So there's not much more that we can do generally to explain to you that we're really not kidding, is there? You know what I mean? Like, that should be a new thing. Like, .NET, totally not kidding. <laughs> That's not an approved marketing you know, thing, but I think it's really important to, to remember. So let's talk about some of the great stuff that you're going to be able to explore. We've got the, the third part of the trilogy coming up uh, after this. We've got the future of C Sharp. We've got Mads and Dustin. are going to talk about that in the Return of the Jedi uh, part of this trilogy. And then uh, tomorrow, we've got Rowan, who owns Entity Framework. And he's going to talk about Entity Framework Core. And he's, he's got a really great way of going from the basics all the way down to the deep dive. So if you're in, in any way interested in Entity Framework, I cannot recommend Rowan's stuff enough. And I would encourage you to check out his blog, because he has these amazing presentations in a box that we're going to try to emulate, which means that if you want to go and teach EF Core or ASP.NET, you'll be able to do that. And all of the stuff that we've been doing at Build all week long, like the great workshops that are happening, I know that's been really frustrating. Some people have been in line at those workshops. All that code's going to be available for you to run your own workshops in the, in the future. Uh, Uni is going to talk about some of the new innovations that are going on in desktop applications in Visual Studio, in Visual Studio 15, the next version of Visual Studio. And then Dan, along with Scott Hunter, is going to go deep dive into MVC Talk about Razor, talk about tag helpers, talk about controllers. We'll talk about config, DI, we'll talk about uh, logging. Dependency injection. Uh, controllers, a whole, you know, a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. that uh, you've not seen uh, in, the, in the talk today. And then Dan, uh, at the, uh, in the 2 o'clock tomorrow, will talk more about deploying ASP.NET Core, which is not just about Docker. This is an example. It's Azure. It's the cloud of choice. It's IIS. It's Azure Stack. It's wherever makes you happy. Whew. Make sure that you do this thing. Flash voting. There'll be people around the room afterwards to, yep. to hear how you're using .NET, ASP.NET. Very important. If you give us just a couple minutes of feedback, it's important. And you get these challenge points. And you can go and register at aka.ms, dev to dev. Uh, make sure that you stop by our booth as well. We've got some real devs that are down there. We brought them in. We brought a lot of the engineering team with yeah, us. The engineering as part of this. team is here. So if you want to see the engineering team, they're in the labs. And yep. they're in the booth both. Yep. And uh, um, Pavel pa pa is there. He helped me make the Raspberry Pi and make that happen. And be sure to scan this uh, QR code, because I'd like to keep working here. All right, I think we're That's done. It. That sounds good. We're done. Yay!